Hello, everybody. Welcome to part four of our reading of the Magdalene Manuscript. If this is your first time on the channel, first of all, welcome. And second of all, you might want to go back and listen to parts one through three first to understand the origins of this manuscript. Now, last week, we left off at a bit of a cliffhanger. I'll read you the last segment of section 13 before we start our reading today with section 14. I wish to share the specifics of this, but in order to do so, I must explain more of the basic understanding of sex and spiritual realization for this secret was stolen by the church. So as I said last week in um, my advertisements for the Magdala Manuscript, we're definitely going to be getting into the positive side of sex magic. Most of us think of this as strictly being a negative thing. And of course, it has been inverted by the dark players. But I want to remind everybody that the darkness cannot create anything. If we even think about photosynthesis in nature, the only thing that can create something is the light. And with the kundalini rising, some of this intimacy is how that kundalini can be activated or triggered. You can also do it by yourself too. But I know I've looked forward a little bit. She's going to start to get into these all these different pathways, which is 100% what we study in yoga. If you join us on Tuesdays on the Dark Outpost, we've been going through the Yoga Sutras. And I have been having uh, numerous conversations with Stephanie Schapp from Spiritual Perspectives of Our Great Awakening, as well as Shanti and Mornay from Aquarius Rising Africa over these different pathways that are inside our human body. Now, again, these are energetic pathways, not necessarily physical, even though they're housed within the physical manifestation of the body. So section 14 starts, when I, an initiated of Isis, joined together with Yahshua, there were specific pathways I had to open within myself. I was stunned, however, to discover that many of these pathways were spontaneously opening in his presence. I mentioned at the beginning of the story how I trembled as a woman, having to struggle with my own passions and desires. For the path of the initiate is to use the energy of passion in a highly specific way and not to simply be carried off by it. For alchemy requires that energy to be contained so that it can be transformed. Once again, yes. Now, you know, we've talked a lot about twin flames and I know that part of the 144,000 theory that's spoken about in the book of Revelation is that of twin flames and their union coming together through intimacy will change the vibrational frequency of the earth, almost like antennas. And that frequency though can only be changed with the power of twin flames being intimate. It doesn't mean that there's not shifts and things happening with soulmates, but this is specific to the twin flames. And what she's talking about with the transformation of energy and containing it, I've spoken about this a lot, even within your own personal practices, regardless of whether it's with somebody else or just by yourself, you have this idea of resistance and friction. You have to have resistance in order to create that friction. And that friction creates that heat that is necessary for change. As my teacher in India says, in order to clean gold, you have to boil the gold so that the impurities can rise to the top and be wiped off. Now, what she's saying here is we can't release the energy. We have to contain it. If you guys have followed a lot of the, my talks on the chakras, I also bring up the bandhas because the bandhas are something that's not spoken about as much as the chakras, but they're just as important, if not more important than the chakras, because those are the locks, the seals. So again, you have mola bandha at the base of your perineum by muladhara, which is the chakra, and that's being able to close that lock to keep the energy within shashumna, within the spine. You have uddiyana bandha in the stomach, which is the pulling up of the navel, and of course, Jalandhara Bandha, which is in the throat, which is big with pranayama, our breathing type exercises. So that's what she's talking about. She's talking about this control of energy. Very quickly, Yashua and I achieved the state, what is known as the four serpents. This occurs when both have mastered the internal alchemies of Horus to the extent that they can achieve both the solar and the lunar serpents within their spine. We're talking about prana and apana. Again, I've spoken about this a lot. The solar is prana. The lunar, the moon, is apana. Solar is rising energy. So pranic is rising energy. Aponic is energy that moves downward. Okay. 
Clairvoyantly, there is a central channel that runs through the spine, and to the left there is a lunar circuit, and to the right there is a solar circuit. This is called the Ida and the Pingala by the yogis and yoginis. Yes, Ida and our Pingala. These are the two nostrils, the left being the feminine, as we spoke about last week, and the right being the masculine, different times of the day. If you ever practiced alternate nostril breathing, now I see people practice alternate nostril breathing very lazily, where they kind of do this. That's not correct, guys. You got to sit up straight, pull your stomach in, and you've got to hold the mudra and a, this is Vishnu mudra in a particular way on the nostrils in order to maneuver the breath between the two sides. At certain points of the day, the left side will be breathing stronger, and at certain points of the day, the right side will be breathing stronger. Um, my left side breathes breathe clearer than my right side, my right nostril. And so sometimes in order to kind of fix that, you can make a fist, stick it in your armpit. There are chakras, energy points in your armpits too. Press into the armpit and that's going to start to open up the other side of the nostril. These are all techniques and practices that have been known in the East for a really long time, but we are completely um, ignorant to here in the West. The alchemies of Horus, one causes these two circuits to be activated by the mag magnetic fields that are snake-like. The lunar snake on the left side is pitch black, the color of the void. So indeed, it is the embodiment of the void itself and holds the potential as the cretex of all things. The solar serpent is gold. The initiate causes these two serpents to rise upward. As they rise upward... They pierce the chakras and cross over each other. In the alchemy of Horus, these two serpents cross each other through the fifth seal or the throat and all seals beneath it. So again, within the fifth seal, the throat, the fifth chakra, which is a blue color, we also have Jalandhara Bunda, which is a lock. That lock is pulling that chin in. So you'll see in a lot of... Um, pranayama exercises the chin is pulled in to the chest in order to open up the back of the uh, neck which the back of the neck is part of the spine it's part of shashumna the eyes are actually the top of the spine so for example in a traditional yoga practice you would never close your eyes never close if your teacher is telling you to close your eyes in yoga practice do not go back to that teacher they don't know what the hell they're talking about and that's dangerous to be practicing with somebody who is ignorant to what they're actually doing the eyes the eyes are the tops of the spine all right and in between the brow is an energy cycle and in the um Right here at the top of the head is another energy cycle. This is where the baby's soft spot is when the baby is born. Also for people who are in Jewish faith, that's why the yarmulke is worn on this area. This is in the top energy point that goes directly into source. All right. And so if we think about where the eyes are placed and it being the top of the side, when we're looking down, instead of looking up, we're directing the energy. So there's a lot of yoga postures where my teacher in India will get mad if you actually look down, you have to keep your head up because it's keeping a clear vessel in your neck. And also another thing, when people do back bending, especially a posture like Urdhva Mukha Savasana, upward facing dog, your drishti, your focal point is actually at your nose. So when you're coming up into up dog, you're looking at the tip of your nose, not up into the forehead. This is super important. Why the tip of the nose? Because the tip of the nose, then in this particular pattern of movement of pulling up, looking at the tip of the nose and dropping the head way back is also another way to open up the back of the neck for Shashumna while also exercising all of the hormones in the front of the neck. Again, this is why it's super important that when you pick a yoga teacher, you pick a yoga teacher who actually has an education, not someone who's just merely been through a teacher training. Okay. Super important guys. Okay. Let's see. Where are we? They then face each other at an area approximately where the pineal gland is or the center of the forehead. Here, a chalice is envisioned with the pineal gland at the very bottom of the chalice itself. Right? So again, that's connecting to this energy point here. The two serpents are living in that they are not static, but vibrate and ripple with energy. And the writhing of these bodies within the ka activates an increase of magnetic potential. There are specific practices, which I will share at a later time. But I what I wish to address in this moment is the practice of the four serpents. I know what she's talking about with the trembling. Um, now, I've never been in the same room with my twin, um, but I don't do know who it is. 
So I don't have that experience, but what I experience I do have again is through my own yoga practice. And in the practice of Ashtanga yoga, we are heavy, heavy, heavy back benders, heavy back benders. Something very magical and spiritual happens in a deep back bend. This is why back bends cannot be avoided. Um, Urdhva Dhanurasana, which is what people typically think of when they think of a back bend, it's oftentimes mistranslated as wheel pose. First of all, please do never call the postures by their English translations. Always call them by their Sanskrit names. That is their real name. And Sanskrit is a holy language with the vibration of the word being part of the healing. So Urdhva Dhanurasana Wheel pose would be chakrasana, which is an, a totally different thing. But urdhvadhanurasana is basically what people think of when they think of backbending. But what people, a lot of people don't realize is that eventually you are going to be catching your ankles. And when you have that ability to one day move the body and mold the body in a way to catch your ankles, what's happening is you're actually opening up the front of your body. I've talked about this a lot with Shanti because she herself is also an India trained yoga teacher. And a lot of times when we think of back bending, we think of literally back bending, but back bending is front opening. Okay. And so I, I you know, for vanity's sake, if you want a six pack, if you want a skinny stomach, do a shit ton of back bends. That's going to get your stomach tight, strong, and small more than any crunches are ever going to do. And a detox is going to start to happen. But when you're in an intense back bend, especially when the solar plexus right here, right beneath the rib cage, all the way down to the navel, all the way down to the perineum, because your mola bunda is also locked in a back bend, you're controlling that energy. The legs are strong. You start to feel this cord of energy basically coming up through your crotch. I know that sounds very strange for me as a woman. It would be through my vagina, like the crotch coming all the way up through the center of the body. You feel it. It's a very, bur it's a burning sensation. It's unlike any other sensation I've ever felt in any other thing in my life um, doing these deep back beds. And the first time I actually felt it, I really understood why why back bending is so freaking important in the Ashtanga system. It's about moving it opening up this pathways in ways that typically we don't do as human beings. People don't really stretch their stomachs, right? Back bending is something that's very purposeful. All right, let's continue to section 15. When Yashua and I made love, as you call it, we caused our serpents to rise up our spines. We did this to we did this simultaneously. And at that moment of mutual orgasm, the charge released from the first seal in the pelvic area of our bodies and went upward into the throne, which is the upper part of the head, stimulating the higher brain centers. So the first seal in the pelvic area, again, is the perineum. It's mola bunda, mola bunda. At the same time, during this moment of sexual ecstasy, we placed our awareness fully within our Ka bodies, for the Ka is the strengthened by ecstasy. Ecstatic states are nourishing and strengthening to the Ka body. And as I said earlier, with each strengthening of the Ka, it became more magnetic, drawing to the initiate that which he or she desires. The sexual magic of Isis has to do with the innate ability of the feminine be, being to utilize magnetic forces to open deeper levels of consciousness through the act of surrendering to the sexual energies and pathways that are opened. I have thought about this a lot as a woman um, in an act of intimacy, and I'm strictly talking about heterosexual relationships here. Of course, this is going to be different for um, homosexual relationships, but for heterosexual relationships, which I am a straight, 100% straight woman, um, you are receiving in the act of, even though in a twin flame union, the woman, the feminine is the one to activate the man. The woman is the one that's actually receiving. That's how the body works. That's how a baby is made. Right. And in order for I, with my own anxiety issues and my own stuff that I've had to work through in my own life with emotional trauma, this idea of being able to surrender and completely let go in an intimate act. That's something that I think a lot of women have a really hard time doing is being able just to totally give herself um, in a controlled way to her partner. It's, it's a very vulnerable, vulnerable place to be. And I think most women kind of know what I'm talking about because you're literally 
allowing somebody inside of you, which is very, very vulnerable. And so that surrendering, being able to surrender to your partner, you have to have 100% trust in that moment, like 100% trust that your partner isn't going to hurt you and they're going to do what's best for you in that situation. So I get what she's saying here with the surrender. When a woman is deeply loved and appreciated as, as I was by Yashua, something lets go at the deepest levels of herself. And at that moment of orgasm, there is an uncontrollable shuddering that takes place. If she feels safe and allows this shaking, this quivering to overtake her, there is a tremendous magnetic vortex that opens in the center of which is her womb. Two initiates engaged in the sexual magic of Isis can strengthen themselves and rapidly expand their consciousness through the power of this magnetic field. In the advanced practices of sexual magic of Isis, the male initiate causes both of his serpents to rise to the cob body of the female, and the female causes her two, two serpents to rise to the cob body of the male. This explosive power of this practice is like the energy released by an atomic BOMB. I can't see that word on YouTube. The massive tidal waves of, ma of magnetics can strengthen the Ka body beyond imagination or destroy it if not handled properly. It was this advanced practice of the Ka that Yahshua engaged that night before the Garden of Gosemite. For him, this tremendous increase of magnetic potential within his Ka strengthened him for the hardships and for the task that faced him in his final initiation through the portal of death. So that when his physical body dissolved into its constituent elements, it was done and so in a flash of light and heat that the church calls the resurrection. But this was simply an effect of something that was occurring much deeper within him. It was caused by the magnetics of his Ka body, for it was through his poten potentialized Ka that his journey through his underworld through death itself. And you guys know that I don't actually believe Yahshua was crucified. Um, I think this is confirmation biased with his crucif crucif crucifixion. I think resurrection has a completely different meaning in my own opinion. And I think it does have a lot to do with the light body activation. As Joshua and I gauged um, with the practices of ISIS, ISIS in our relationship, we both understood that this was the purpose. For him, each union with me was a means to strengthen his Ka. This is why I said earlier that he came to my well. For the, for the well that the woman initiate offers to the male is an endless well of magnetic potential. But it is only open when the female feels safe and loved. Boom, I just said this, right? When the female is able to trust. So men... If you want to experience this with your partner or your soon-to-be partner, you have got to earn her trust. That is the only way that a woman is going to be able to completely let go and open up emotionally, physically, everything in a situation like this. All right. Only then will the practice work. For the practices without the nutrients of love become just techniques and will not give the results required or desired. For me, I was both woman and initiate. I had been trained for years and knew what to do with the pathways, but I was surprised to find myself swept away as a woman. I found myself waiting in the deepest anticipation for a look or a touch by Yahshua. And our times together alone were the most precious times I have ever experienced. Something about his touch and his eyes, the feel of him caused something within me to open. And I found myself sometimes almost laughing at myself. I, who had been trained in the most secret practices of the sex magic of Isis, had been judged by my priestesses to be very advanced. This initiate found herself a mere beginner in the presence of the woman. Yep, that's right. The woman is the, you know, I kind of see it like when you're looking at, divine feminine and divine masculine obviously within the relationship both are equal and that's what we're getting back to is this equal balance of energy and power within the micro within your own relationship and also within the macro and there are times i believe anyway that the man needs to be the alpha like i want a man who is bigger than me taller than me stronger than me like i i that's sexy to me i don't want to feel like i'm gonna break my partner or that i'm the one that's got to go deal with you know, i want a man that's going to protect me that's sexy to me as a woman. I want to be the feminine. I want to be the, the, um, the pretty one. I want to be, you know, the, the, the female, I want to be the girl. Um, but then 
in times of this, yes, I think the woman does have more of that power. And a lot of it also comes down to the way energy works as well. Men, even though men and women both share a lot of the same energetic patterns, like the men is dominantly pranic while the woman is dominantly uponic, but each have both energies within their systems. Men, a man's body is more linear and a woman's body is uh, runs in circles more. There's more of a spiral, but the spiral also exists within the man and also it gives, exists within the woman and the linear exists within the woman but dominantly you think of a woman's body is more in that curvy that cycle that that moves with energy kind of like the slide at the mcdonald's you know that slide that goes down whereas for men it's very straight and linear um and so because the woman is dominantly in this pattern of energy she's the one that's able to kind of move more i don't want to get pornographic or anything but she's the one that's able to really move um you know, and of course, if there's trust there, then magic can happen. All right, let's see. For I tell you now that within the heart of the mind and the body wisdom of the feminine lies some of the greatest secrets and greatest powers, and they await to be revealed. And all of it laid open by the touch of another. And so whenever I speak of Yahshua, I'm overcome by my love and the feelings that I hold for him throughout all time. 16. The sex magic of Isis is based upon the realization that the female, the feminine principle holds within her nature, specifically her sexual nature, an alchemic key. This alchemic key is revealed in the act of what you call love, sexual love. When this is activated strongly enough, the alchemies of Horus spontaneously present themselves. So I now actually, truly, honestly, 100% believe, I know, I know because of, of I've seen my records and my needle chart and all that kind of stuff. I was in this priestesshood. I, I know that I was um, in a past life. And even though I grew up in a very prudish society, I think a lot of my studies of yoga in India, and, and I, we didn't talk about this in, um, in my yoga school, like it was ne this kind of stuff was never spoken about. It was all just your internal stuff. But I think a lot of what the universe did for me, sending me to India all those years, there's multi, multi reasons why, but one was to understand how energy work, because I do feel like this is going to be something that's going to be coming into my life at some point, to be honest with you guys. Again, I know I've done this before in a past life. Um, and I think that that, that is part of, part of why I spent so many years in India studying is because I had to understand energetic body so that I would understand my own energy and my own power as a female, especially as a female that grew up down here in the deep South. And even though um, the men I was around as a child didn't treat women badly, but women were also subservient. And so to understand the power that you have as a woman and this kind of activation is really, really important. And I think now at 39, I can look back and say, yeah, most of my adult life was remembering this and studying this. Okay. So and probably some of you guys might feel the same way too. Within my training, it was understood that there were two paths, alchemically speaking, to the same goal. The alchemies of Horus were the foundation of both alchemies or practices, since the same fundamental pathways were used. For those who did not wish to engage in partnership, the alchemies of Horus would provide a means to strengthen and activate the Ka body to the levels of high initiateship. And something interesting too, so I, after I started reading the Magdalene manuscript, I was doing a channeling and Horace came through into the channeling. And I never had Horace come into my channeling before. I know Horace was not bad. That's something that the bad players have tried to manipulate. He's just another um, entity of avatar of Christ consciousness. Um, Horace came through. And when I asked why Horace was around me, he came through with some orbs and um, he said, because of this, it's almost time. It was almost time for me to be activated again um, with a partner. So we'll see. Time is different in the spirit world, though. That is something that we've all had to learn. The quantum and the earth plane have two very, very different perceptions of time. That is for sure. For those in partnership, the sexual magic of Isis would provide the wings by which they would ascend the spine and into the throne of the highest consciousness. From my vantage point, I see a great tragedy in the secrets and the holiness of our sexual natures was made evil by the church, by the church fathers. And for nearly 2000 years now, the most dynamic and one of the most rapid ways to God's realization has been made wrong. Boom, boom, boom. 
And I find it indeed ironic that the church has made it a sin and therefore terrified those who might have stumbled upon it because the church is part of the dark cult. They don't want you to find enlightenment for sure. They don't want you to find enlightenment. All right. 17. While the miracles of Yahshua are considered extraordinary by many, they are from the standpoint of the initiate, simply the expression, the natural expressions of the potential of consciousness. They are a sign. There are reasons for miracles. And I wish to discuss these from the standpoint of the initiatory knowledge that Yahshua and I possessed. Absolutely. In Pada's, uh, in the Yoga Sutras, Pada, third and fourth Pada talk about the Siddhis, which you're not really supposed to talk about. But the Siddhis are what they call yogic powers, which is a lot of what Yahshua could do, like levitation. That's walking on water is levitation, the healing of the body through hands. Um, Reiki, uh, all sorts of stuff, being able to make food multiply like Yahshua did. And um, you read about it in the Yoga Sutras as well. And so Yahshua wasn't the only person on the earth that could do these things. That's what the church doesn't tell you. A lot of people have, have possessed these siddhis to their own work and their own activation. And I think for us moving into this new timeline, this new earth, we're going to be activating our car body, our life body, and we'll probably be able to remember how to do some of these things too. By the time I met Yahshua, he was already demonstrating the signs. His level of creation was very high, high vibrational. My task was to assist him to strengthen his Ka body for his final initiation through the death portal to the high God Horus. This was accomplished, as I have said, through the sex magic of Isis and the alchemies of Horus. Of all the miracles that I witnessed Yahshua performed, the one that is the most dear to me is that of the loaves and the fishes. And we know that it wasn't fishes from the gospel of the Holy 12. Yahshua was a vegetarian, as was all of his disciples. That is made very clear in a lot of the missing books of the Bible that you are not to eat meat if you want to, um, if you want to move up in consciousness. And this is not... I am a vegetarian. I've been a vegetarian for most of my life, but I don't judge people who eat meat. In fact, every single person I've dated, except for a couple, have been meat eaters. That's not my family's meat eaters. That's your choice. But I just wanted to let you guys know that that is spoken about in some of the missing books, that part of uh, being a vegetarian, according to this practice, the original practice of Christianity, which was tied into the priestess and priesthood of Isis, not eating meat came from many different perspectives. One, it wasn't our right to eat another living thing because as Yahshua says in the gospel of the Holy 12, they are your brothers and sisters too. Do the animals not breathe the same air you do? Um, the second reason why is that by taking in a dead animal, you're taking in the vibration of that animal. Um, think about what the, uh, the bad guys do, right? Um, so you're taking in that vibration, you're taking in that karma, and that can lower you, lower your vibrational density. Um, and so that's another reason as well. Um, as far as what you choose to do with your diet, totally up to you. Again, like I said, most of the people I've dated have been heavy meat eaters. Only a couple have not been eat meat eaters um, in the yoga world. Uh, it's not something I'm super picky about when it comes to people I'm around, even though I am vegetarian, I'm not someone that's really judgmental about that, but that's just something interesting for you to know. And that's your choice. What do you do with that information? It was a very long, hot day. The disciples, Mary and myself were following the master as usual, a very large crowd formed, listening intently upon every word from Yahshua's mouth. We were all enraptured by his vision and his means of expressing. It was as if for several hours we were transported into heaven itself. And I noticed that Yahshua's Ka had expanded to include everyone, another sign. When he had completed his speaking, it was late in the afternoon and, and filled with compassion for them, realizing that their walk home could take some of them several days. He called upon food to be gathered and shared. So the disciples, Mary and I, and a few others who joined us from the crowd began to collect food. But when it was all gathered, there were only a few fishes and a few small loaves of bread, hardly enough. And again, if you remember from the missing books of the Bible that we covered, it was bread and grapes, not fishes, but grapes. But again, again, confirmation bias from the person channeling, right? Uh, the story we've been told is that it was bread and fish. And so when you're getting the information, that's probably what's triggering your mind as you're channeling, because that's what you know. But when we know better, we do better and we course correct. And so it was actually grapes and fish, not uh, grapes and bread, not fish and bread. It was then that I witnessed the most remarkable event. 
Yasha went inside and closed his eyes. I could feel the intent of his prayer, although I did not hear the words. Running the full course from his spine, from the base of his spine to the top of his head, I clairvoyantly saw a burst of light flowing upwards through his crown into his ba, his celestial soul. And then an energy descended as if it an answer to his request. And he placed his hands over the two small baskets and began to hand out the loaves of fish, breaking them into pieces and handing one to each person himself. The most remarkable, over a thousand people were fed and the loaves and fishes never exhausted themselves. After the crowd had been fed, Joshua gave pieces to his disciples and to Mary and myself. And the bread had the most sweet taste and the fish a wonderful flavor I had never experienced again. If you read, I believe it's one of Bhagavan Das's autobiographies, or it might have been one of Ram Das's. It's one of the Das's books where they talk about Maharaji, their guru, and there's a story. And again, I, I'm, I apologize. I can't remember if it was Bhagavan Das or Ram Das who was driving um, Maharaji, their guru, in a car in India, or actually it would be reversed because they drive on the right side, even sitting on the left. And they talk about um, him like disappearing and then coming back again. There's also a scene where they talk about him making more apples appear. So yes, these are Sidhis. It's not, Yashua isn't the only one who was able to do this. They've been, there've been other people, other humans that have reached this level of, of understanding of consciousness to be able to change matter and change consciousness before them in order to make food multiply, bodies disappear, all that kind of stuff. Such miracles are natural to a master of Yahshua's caliber. And from the initiatory standpoint, such miracles are the potential of anyone if they practice what is required. Absolutely. 18. Yahshua often used the phrase, I, am the, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. That's samadhi. That's the union with God. This has led to a great misinterpretation. From the initiatory standpoint, it was simply another word for spirit. And in these words, Yahshua was indicating that he merged with his spirit, and that is how the miracles were accomplished. And so we would go back and forth between two ideas, which the Gospels report in their own limited way. On one hand, Yahshua would sometimes say, I and the Father are one. And on other times, he would say, without my Father, I can do nothing. This is the oscillation that occurs when the initiatory process in which the initiate oscillates between strength and convention and convict and conviction of his, her connection to the spirit source and then to the other state of mind in which they realize they are nothing and can do nothing without spirit. So the one state of mind has a feeling of omnipotence and the other state of mind has the feeling of impotence and the initiative must pass between these two. That Yahshua used these phrases several times indicated to me as a fellow initiate that he was in the middle of this paradox. And what do we say? What do we learn from Megan Watterson's book on Mary Magdalene? To be 100% human and 100% divine. That's what she's talking about here. And he lived with his paradox and consciousness until the Garden of Gethsemane. For it was before this time in the garden, as reported by his disciples, that he came to me and we practiced the four serpents for the last time. There was an intensity in our time together, for we both know that time was near at hand. With the explosive force released with the practice, Yashua's Ka body scintillated with power and convention, which he took with him into the final hours of his life, fortifying him for his journey through death. But the times before were often spent. I searched for the right words in a kind of self-questioning. And you can, I can also see the idea of his death being kind of a death to your old life or your old understanding. I feel like I've gone through many deaths in my 39 years in this one life as I've evolved and as I've, I've, um, I put a lot of effort, I mean, even before this great awakening, and I, I know now that every, again, back in India and all my years before this, it was preparing me for this time. I didn't know it at the time, at the time I was just going to learn myself and to learn God and to feel closer to God and understand my energetic body. But now I know that it was preparing me for now, but even through all that time, there, there were moments where I left, I shut off. Um, old parts of me, old thought patterns about who I am as a person that don't serve me anymore. It's interesting. I'm obviously, you guys know, I'm a huge lover of history and I'm a huge lover of literature and all that kind of stuff. And as I've gone more into this type of understanding about energetic body and putting every, all the pieces together, I'm actually more interested now in my celestial heritage, my star chart, not necessarily my natal chart. 
I need my natal chart. My natal chart is what gives me indication of this life, but my star chart, which has also been stolen and used by the way, um, gives me more of a history of myself as a soul. And that to me, when I made that shift over time to caring more about that, that past versus the earthly past was also a death upon itself because I was more interested as in, into who I am as Lyran, as, as someone from a different galaxy, if that makes sense. And, and I think that that was kind of a death within me where I kind of left the, the human stuff behind because that I was done with that. I shedded that. And now I wanted to learn about more about the celestial, the Ba, as it's called here. I hope that makes sense. Those who followed Yahshua, who called themselves Christians, like to think that he was sure-footed and always clear about his purpose and mission, and that he never wavered. But I, who spent the nights with him, tell you otherwise. Just because, be just because a being has attained a level of mastery does not mean that they are able to pass through uncertainty untouched. Absolutely, that's part of the journey, is your doubt. Yahshua felt the pressure of his celestial soul, but it is an odd thing to be an initiate. For one is human with all that goes with it, and one is increasingly connected to and part of one celestial soul. It's the Ba, the celestial soul that is the voice of God speaking. The high initiate acts like a reflex from the mouth of God, but just because the celestial soul, but just because the celestial soul is clear, it does not mean that the human is necessarily so. Absolutely, the higher self, the lower self. I think you guys get what she's saying here. Yahshua saw in others the potential for God realization, and he spoke to this several times. One of the, these was mentioned in the Gospels when he said, you shall do greater things than me. I believe that's in the book of John, where he says, you shall do greater things than me. For he understood that miracles are natural expressions of consciousness, and that as the consciousness of mankind expanded, miracles would be commonplace. And yet at the same time, he was very aware of the limitations of those around him for their addictions to hatred, ignorance, and bigotry. And this troubled him deeply. We spent many evenings talking about this. And until a few days before Gethsemane, he was not sure he could attain what was required to pass through the final initiation. I do not know the reason for the change in him, but a few days before the garden and our final initiatory act together through the four serpents, a deep sense of peace came over him. And he was sure in a way I had never seen him. 19. I stand in time nearly 2,000 years after Yahshua's crucifixion, and I still shake at the thought of that. It was very strange to be both the initiate and the woman. As the initiate, I stood by Yahshua through the crucifixion, holding my call in fervent prayer, which is another way of saying I held steadfast in my intention to be there for him as he passed into death. This was an initiatory action on my part that required detachment. As a trained initiate, such a task was easy, but as a woman in love with Yahshua, the man, my heart was ripping apart. And so I stood wavering in my strength as an initiate and my grief as the woman in love whose beloved was suffering. In that moment, I did not care for the initiation. I did not care that Yahshua was laying a trail of light through the death realms for those who would follow him. I even yelled at Isis. How dare you? I said. In my greatest moment of torment, Mary reached out and touched my hand. I had been alone in my grief and I had not noticed hers. Our eyes met, filled with tears, and we sobbed in each other's arms. She for her son and I for my beloved. The Gospels report that an earthquake struck right after Yahshua's passing, and I say to you that this is true. It was as if all of the nature went into a trail veil and the earth shook with anger and rage that such a master, such a being could suffer at the hands of his fellow men. But such is the paradox of life on earth. A great storm came across the city as well, winds like I had not seen. The sky filled with dark clouds and bolts of lightning, the sound of thunder shaking everything. This horrific display lasted its scene forever but I suspect it was only an hour or so. At the tomb, Mary and I washed his body in accordance with Jewish ritual and tradition, wrapped him and left the tomb. We did this in silence. The only sound, the sound of our muffled tears, but we know again that they were not Jewish. 
Um, so I don't know why at this point he would be buried in Jewish ritual because um, as she even says, they, they were not Jewish. So again, that could be confirmation bias coming from the person channeling this because that was a story we've been told for so long. I thought it odd that he had been able to raise Lazarus from the dead, but had not been able to help himself. I did not understand what he was doing. But after his resurrection and I saw him in his ka, radiant and beautiful as ever, I understood. From the initiatory standpoint, to become the high god Horus means that one has activated the highest potentials of consciousness within the human form. But this was traditionally done for oneself only. But Yahshua had done it on behalf of all mankind. This was his legacy. And this I actually disagree with. I don't think this is what happened. Um, and that that is, again, I believe confirmation bias on the part of the channeler because we have been taught that Jesus was the savior. And I'm here to tell you that human sacrifice is never going to cleanse your karma. That is something that the dark ones want you to believe because they want you to be prepared to celebrate human sacrifice, okay? You have to clear your karma. Now, with that being said, you're not gonna go to hell. There's no, that. that's not That's not a thing, right? That's If we, if we, read, the, if we read the missing books of the Bible, we see that's not a thing. That's a thing in Satanism. That's not a thing in true Christianity. Your karma, the stuff that you have to work through to find yourself, to cleanse yourself, to purify yourself, to activate yourself, even though that karma is hard to work through, it's a power move. It's a blessing that you have. And so he didn't do that for you. He, did, he came as a teacher. Him and Magdalene were teachers to teach you. And the teacher's job is to eventually not be needed. But I say to you, it has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with physics and alchemy. The simple teachings of Yahshua was that we are all gods, that we all have within us the power to love and to heal. And he demonstrated this as best he could. In the early days of the church, meaning the community of those who formed around Yahshua's teaching, a most beautiful ritual emerged. Those who wished to continue to be in his energy or presence would share bread and wine. Sometimes the men would share the rituals and sometimes the women. The simple act of sharing among each other was in keeping with Yahshua's intent. And yet as the years progressed and simplicity of this got lost and only those ordained by the church could give communion, something which Yahshua would find most distasteful, having known him as well as I did, I can tell you this. The truth and power of Yahshua's teachings has been perverted by the church. And the secrets of the elevation of consciousness through sacred sex was practiced by I and Yahshua has been stolen by the church. And I realize in sharing my story that only a handful would understand. But is that enough?